Be so nasty and get it now or someone's getting shot. And that's Anisha, Venisha, Venisha, Venisha. Those in comments. Selling a hemorrhoid cream to someone who's got hemorrhoids. Got a whip. I was born into a deep contradiction. This stuff's magic. God, that's so clever. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the last time on Artifact Live, but only in the morning. I'm moving the show to 12.30 next week. Um, I've had a few people ask me to, to think about moving it because more and more people are back in the office. So I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to move it. So it's been a tough week for me here. Uh, we've all had COVID and you might hear a slight um, catch on my throat, uh, unfortunately. So uh, I'm okay. It's just I've been in my bed for four days and this is the first time I've Get out of my bed to do anything, so it's uh, it's quite nice. But I am looking forward to it, and I didn't want to move this because I feel that this is a, a really fascinating topic that I wanted to 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 talk to you about and to to share some experiences and get my my guest on today to talk about it with you. But it's uh, it's going to be one of those shows where. <clears throat> I might do <clears throat> that quite a lot. Um, I've got a bottle of water here, so hopefully, hopefully, I can I can uh, sound at least partially coherent uh, as we go through the the session. In the last couple of shows, um, we've gone and down a route that I never expected us to take, and that that was a route of where we looked at the sort of human traumas and human uh, struggles um, related to storytelling. And we heard from uh, experts that talked about how maybe stories are only part of the answer and there's a lot more to it. We heard from another person who had, uh, oh, it was an amazing last week. I don't know if you remember, I'll, I'll put his picture back up again. Last week we had Chris on. And, and Chris Freer had a, an incredible story about, uh, it was everything from bravery to to, to passion, to pain, to, to nutrition, to recovery, transformation. You know, oof, it was covered everything. But at the heart of all that, it was it was lovely to hear Chris in his very down to earth way uh, tell a story of of how he he came through that uh, and is is flourishing as a consequence. So it was it was a real pleasure to have to have Chris on. So so this week and this 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 was just. This just happened naturally. Um, I was looking for guests for the show, as I always am, and I came across someone who I thought, "Oh my goodness, look at this!" Uh, and and and, and it, it was like it couldn't have been. I couldn't have set it up better, to be honest. Um, it's just like, "Oh, this is perfect," because what my guest this week does is she takes um, literature and she takes stories and uses it for all sorts of different purposes and one of them is for, for therapy, she uses books for therapy so I think it's terrific so I'm going to introduce my, my guest now so I'll just get you on now, Bijal, here we go welcome to the show, how are you? oh <laughs> there we go, we're having a little bit of problem with you, ah uh, yeah you you seem to be coming on and off the stream, so we might have a little problem here. We might have to reboot and restart, Michelle. But how are you? Nice to nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Yeah, it's me. so lovely to see you, and I'm so delighted to be here on this show. I think there's such a overlap between what you do and what I do, and I cannot wait to to learn more. Someone in LinkedIn has just yeah. Someone in LinkedIn has just said that they much prefer my studio background. Have no fear; it's still there. Um, I'm looking at uh, what I'm going to do over the next uh, little while, and I've been not redesigning it. It's the same. It's still there. It's all well. I can prove it to you. Um, as it, yeah, still there. Uh, but I've been doing some uh, recording for a client, and they they needed me to have a, a a nice simple background, which is why I've got the nice simple background. Um, so ho hopefully it will make a comeback. Now the the interesting thing is that in the next. Uh, uh, the sort of the next session, if you like, um, I've got some ideas, so I, I, I'm looking forward to changing things. But don't worry, it's coming back. I'm not getting rid of the artifact. Well, aha, we're back now. Hi, Scott. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ah, no. Let's do that fun. again. <laughs> <laughs> and fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, it looks stable. Um, so fingers, I think there must be a little, there's maybe a little loose wire somewhere in your camera on your, your laptop. Um, you around, so, yeah, um, I don't know what's happening. Can you hear me now? I'm just going to... 
there's a little bit of echo, but let's okay. I'll 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 shush and I'll ask you to if you could you could, let's start again with um could welcome to the show <laughs> and um could you could you let people know how you got into this incredibly interesting idea? It's not something I've ever heard of before. Bibliotherapy. How how did you get into that? How did that come about? Sure. Yeah. So when I was um so doing my training as a a uh, counsellor and psychotherapist, we had to um, do a lot of training ourselves. So part of the training is being in therapy. And um, during those therapy sessions, I'd find myself leveraging literature a lot. So, you know, referring a lot to the Greek myths and Greek tragedies and like even um, some of George Eliot's work. Um, and just, you know, I'd just be reaching out to books a lot. Um, and I felt that there was something really powerful here in terms of, you know, being able to explore your own feelings um, from a safe space, uh -huh. um, which was through the character in the book or through the protagonist or through the story. And, um, you know, it's not a new thing because a lot of art therapy does the same. You know, we, yeah. we kind of draw things and then we talk about the picture rather than talking about ourselves. Yeah. Um, so... So that's sort of how I came came across it, and I sort of began like a whole sort of series of research into the topic and into bibliotherapy. Um, and you know, there's a whole host of um, you know literature and research um, done around the subject. Um, yeah. There's an excellent book um, by Dr. Calder Green that only just came out last last year called Rethinking Therapeutic Reading, and she really sets out like the history of how. Uh, therapeutic reading has come about and you know the sort of four main I guess you know founders or not founders but key influences in this space um, starting from sort of I guess uh, all the way back from the Stoics and Seneca to Montaigne to George Eliot um, and, and, and also Wordsworth um, and the use of different literary I guess inventions if you want to call them that but really yeah. you know the the greek tragedy um the essay which montaigne wrote a lot uh, you know he, he examined a lot of his ideas through personal essay the novel which was very much eliot's and you know george Eliot was obviously a, a great novelist and then wordsworth poetry so those are sort of the four sort of uh, literary inventions that I would call, as I call them, that are just really profound in um, in achieving some sort of personal healing, and 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 you know they facilitate therapy and healing. Um, oh, anyway, that was my story, and um, and I eventually sort of ended up launching a bibliotherapy practice, um, providing sessions, but also kind of curating reading lists for both personal interest and therapy. Um, I had a lot of people who were just curious and you know wanted specific literature about specific things that they were going through. Yeah. Um, so let me let me I mean I, I had I guess I guess I had an inkling that such a thing existed because I mean I've been reading I've been reading the Stoics every day for 30 years. I've been reading Tolstoy every day for the last 10 years. Um, you know it's part of my daily practice yeah um, it's not something i ever saw as a therapeutic practice it was more a an intellectual practice for me i don't i, I never saw it as any any therapeutic practice but um where, where did the idea come? I, I, honestly i've never heard of it where, where did this first what, what how can a book act as a therapeutic tool yeah so i mean We've been doing this for years. Our relationship with books has been around for, you know, millenn two, three millennia, ever since the book was really invented. Yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, in terms of formalizing it or giving it a label, um, I think what happened was, especially during the World Wars, um, you know, there were literally libraries attached to hospitals because... Mm -hmm. Uh, there was so much trauma in 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 the world wars, and and soldiers needed um, a, a, a beyond just the medicinal treatment. They did need a sort of a lot of sort of, I guess, mental health kind of um, you know not well mental health treatment, but not quite therapy. Yeah. And obviously, we hadn't really got to the Freudian stages, or there wasn't really therapy as we know it now. And so. Um, they would just be reading poems, doctors would be writing poems, you know, to their patients, like, 
John Keats was a classic example. Um, yeah. He was a doctor, but also a great poet. Um, and, you know, a lot of amazing poetry got written during that, that World War yeah. era, and people would just be, uh, soldiers would, would really be using it. And so there was a lot of literature that was curated at the time to offer it to these soldiers and et cetera. But then there, off the back of that, there was a lot of research that was done. And I think it was in 1950 or 1949, Caroline Schroes, who um, actually as part of her dissertation and her, her PhD, she kind of pulled together a real framework for bibliotherapy, uh, which is not so different to other conventional forms of therapy, but kind of using things like, um, you know, identification with the character um, and then being able to connect with the text and explore our feelings and thoughts and hopefully using that to get to a state of catharsis as we would in any therapy um, and then also reaching um, some sort of resolution at the end or, um, you know, just being able to sit with our feelings and, and in a safe, safe space. And I guess literature kind of creates a safe space when we are reading because right. um, we, we kind of feel safe, we connect and we also feel safe to explore the feelings in the book which might be triggers for us but also feel safe to explore them from a distance. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So, And I think, you know, a lot of therapy, has been, bibliotherapy has been built off the back of her work but then also it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of pretty similar to many other forms of art therapy mm -hmm. out there. Right. So there was one, one I mean, your, your website's extraordinary. The, 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 the number of books that you've got on there is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> if, I, if I come along and, and if people haven't seen your website, it, it's it's well worth a look, actually. Um, but if, if I come along and, and you you offer to write a prescription for me. I love that that that, that you say on the website. You know, you'll you'll do a prescription for a, uh, someone who needs some help. What would you do? How how would you go about um, coming up with the right prescription for somebody who'd come to see you? What's that process like? Sure. So I get you to um, fill out a questionnaire. Like normally it's on the website, but it can also be you know offline. And I would do. Um, I would want to a make sure it's really, really tailored to what you're interested in because you have to be invested in the reading. And if it's not something that would strike a chord with you, there's no point in prescribing it or suggesting it. And so I would sort of ask you, you know, do you prefer fiction, nonfiction? What kind of genres do you like? What authors do you like? What kind of books do you like? Mm -hmm. Just to get a sense of um, your, you know, what you actually like to read. Um, and then of course, like what issues are you looking to explore? Is there something specific? Because obviously, like, that's the whole purpose of, of the list. Uh -huh. um, and then, of course, understanding your reading habits, like actually how much time do you have to read? Because some people will have lots of time, you know, those who are retired and, and then those who, you know, are struggling on the day to, on a day-to-day -day basis might only have, an, you know, maybe even 15 minutes a day, like before bed or something. So, you know, I'd be very sort of mindful of that, like what's going to, be an, extra, an efficient form of reading for them? Is it like a short story collection? Is it like a poetry collection or right. you know, a short novella? Um, and and of course, or like a short nonfiction book if that's their preference. So like that's really important, that reading time plus reading habits. You know, are you a paperback reader? Are you audio? Are you Kindle? Because different books are available in different formats. Yeah. So I guess I would do, I would like create a picture of like your reading profile and then also what are the issues that you are seeking to explore the therapeutic reading yeah and like i said i also do it for sort of doesn't have to be therapeutic but like personal development like if it's a career change that you're going through or um if it's something you, you're keen to learn more about like art and culture or you know writing improve your writing skills it's just yeah it can be really tailored i've also had lots of people ask me about travel that's interesting for them and is, yeah. is, is this the sort of the thank you for that we're getting a little bit of echo as well at the moment i don't know if you can hear it at your end particularly when i speak no um is that what you would call being is that the curation part of, of the role that you that you do is that is that what you would call that is that book curation yeah. right. i would i would call that book curation definitely right. yeah right 
I mean, versus therapy, which is the actual therapeutic process of healing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Healing. So it, it's quite interesting this because the way I read, I mean, I read three books a week usually. That's uh, fantastic. <laughs> I have done that forever. You know, I've done that all my, you know, probably all my adult life. Um, That's why you're such a great storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't feel like it today. I have to say, thanks to COVID, <laughs> I need to start telling stories about COVID. But um, I, I would be terrified for someone trying to curate a book list for me. Now, that's not arrogant. It's just, I, I, you know, I, I, the way I learn is organic. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a, you know, a stream of books around. What have I got here? I'm just grabbing one. Right, this is. Right, here's here, right. That's the one next to me. The deeper. This is about the genome, human genome project. Right. Oh yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and I will spend this guy. I actually met this guy, and he gave me this. Um, but I'll 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 read that book, and then I'll say, okay, John John Parrington says this, but he recommends I read this, and I'll spend the next six months probably following that book, if you like. But it's the the tendrils of that book into yeah. into literature. Some of it will be good, some of it will be rubbish. Um, you know, it, it's uh, just the way I do it. So how, how would you interrupt me? If I, I mean, if I came to you and I said, um, uh, I need some help with uh, concentration, you know, how, and I read lots, you know, what, what would... <laughs> What would your, how, how would you cope with, <laughs> with an annoying person like me? But I don't mean it in that way. I mean, what would you then say to me? Okay, this is your habits, and I read all the time, so that, that's easy. easy. But what, how would you tease out of me, or or from your experience and your? I mean, it's fascinating. This, this I love it. Um, how how would you tease out from the literature? Because there's so much literature, you know. What, what would what would be helpful? Yeah, so I would, if you're telling me you've got issues with concentration, I would, you know, it's it's quite easy to jump to sort of a psychiatric <laughs> diagnosis yeah. as well. Like, you know, what is it? Is it why why are you so distracted? Um, mm -hmm. What are the reasons behind that? So I'd sort of look into into that, and that that could be a very <laughs> variety of things, right? Like from ADHD or autism, but it could be that yeah. it's, you don't really have that and it's just like yeah. some traits that you're experiencing. Yeah. Um, and then I would sort of prescribe some some books that might be good for like habit formation. And obviously one of the things you want to focus on is is, is building a habit on focus, right? Yeah, um, so, yeah. that, yeah. um, so I'd be looking to literature that kind of offers that. Um, you know, the book that springs to mind is Atomic Habits. It's, it's really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but kind of, I would probably, and it depends, it sounds like you prefer nonfiction, so yeah. I would probably sort of draw, draw in books from, from that perspective. I'd also like you to, um, and I, I do this with all my clients, is do some journaling. Yeah. Because, um, you know, it's such a big part of like self therapy and self healing as well, as well as yeah, taking yeah. it to a therapist if you wanted, yeah. um, which is sort of trying to understand. The issues that you're facing, trying to explore them, what what you might have picked out from from literature, how the literature is making you feel as well, because yeah. all these things do do trigger emotions in us. Um, yeah. Whether we and often we'll probably choose to ignore them or not acknowledge them, but I think it's really important to honor those feelings as you're sitting right. with the books or yeah. the story, because it's telling you something and just noticing what's going on in your body, etc. Um, so yeah. I'd want you to write down. That and we'd see like, you know, over the days how that's changing, okay. um, yes. and just do like a summary at the end. Um, yeah, uh, fab. I really, I'm, I, I'm really quite fascinated by this. Um, okay, let let me let me take us into the area that I I am probably most excited to talk to you about because. One one of the things that's become very clear to me over the last thirty years is that facts are important, very important, mm -hmm. but it's the stories that tend to sell things. It's not the facts, you know, you can, uh, and I've got a professor coming on in, uh, next week from the States who specializes in this area. So we're going to have another conversation about this in a couple of weeks. But how, 
where would you sit the sort of the self storytelling? You know that I call it being an archaeologist of your own life. You know, I I I mine my life constantly. I create stories nearly every day from, from my life, um, and people like that you know, they, they say because you know, they've never heard it before. It's a new story. Um, it's a true story, oftentimes. Um, and I'm often told about people that they find it very difficult to come up with their own stories. Um, now, I know you've written extensively and you've written poetry, you've written books, you've, you know, you're very experienced in a journalist, way more experienced than me. Um, so how, how would you suggest, or what do you think about that, you know, people writing their own stories, but how should they go about it? Sure. So, I mean, have you heard of narrative storytelling? Um, uh, well, I know narrative poetry. Um, I'm okay. not sure about narrative storytelling. Yeah, so narrative storytelling, I guess, is, um, and we use this with children a lot, which is kind of, if they're worried about something, is to kind of make themselves the main character of their own story and write their story as though they resolved the problem that they're facing. Right. So it's very much, they like, um, they're processing what's going on for them, but also kind of work problem solving, mm -hmm. and that's um, and that's really sort of a therapeutic tool that people use called yeah, literally called narrative storytelling, which is really writing stories with you as the main character or you as the protagonist. Okay. Um, so you know, we we tend to use that a lot with children. I think children's imaginations are fantastic. So they're very it's very easy for them <laughs> to kind of, you know, come up with things or say things. Um, but I think obviously as an adult, you know, writing your own stories can sometimes feel quite daunting. We all have writer's blocks, you know. Um nice. but I would always my first tip would always be like just write as though nobody is like reading. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you know, that judgment is such a defense, it's going to stop you from writing. Yes. Um, and secondly, I always say, actually, the best time to write is when you're feeling a really strong emotion. And that could be if you're feeling really angry or really anxious or really irritated, like that is the time to write. Oh, right. okay. because, um, and I do that, especially with poetry or confessional poetry, like the best poetry is written like when you're in the midst of like emotion. Um, so I, you know, those would be like my two big tips. And then also, um, you know, kind of just uh, whenever you see things in your day that resonate with you, write it down in a book, just carry a little notebook and just write things down that really resonate with you because um, they're telling you something mm -hmm. and you might make some meaning from it and yes. in your writing. Um, and it might inspire you or inspire a story or something. Um, so, and that's also, that. those are the kinds of things that are also going to move others if they were to read your work, you know. Yes, yes. It's going to be a thing. So. Right, okay, okay. I mean, it, it, it's nice to hear somebody who knows what they're talking about, talking about this stuff, because it, I, I've suspected a lot of these things uh, for a long time and uh, wondered if, if I was up up the right tree if you know what I mean but uh, so again if I was a, uh, I mean a lot of my clients are business people uh, they're, they're usually working for large complex organisations uh, and, and many many times they are under pressure because of that because they've got you know, shareholders or they've got founders or they've got whatever to report to and they've got you know, 50,000 people working for them and they're, they're, they're wondering how on earth they're going to engage them. How, how can storytelling help in that context? Well, in terms of reading you know, other people's stories, but also creating your own. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, if you're like a high-level executive who's got very yeah. little more time to kind of, yeah. you know, um, go and write their own story or... or um, you know, what I would say is really just um we you know, we'd get we'd get them like a reading rest that's tailored to sort of um A the the little limited time that they have, but also B to kind of, you know, three or four books that are really gonna um influence them and really going to kind of uh I guess impact them to to make whatever changes that they're seeking to make. Um 
and that could be like probably like an audiobook or something, a non-fiction audiobook if, if they like non-fiction. Um, as many, I know many execs <laughs> do enjoy reading like a lot of non-fiction as well. Yeah. Um, just to kind of, um, you know, make, sh- make sure that they have time to listen, they can listen to this like on the go. Um, and, you know, forcing them to do a little bit of journaling um, after having read something because that's really, really important. as a, as a reflective tool of yes. what it's bringing up for them. Um, and and just drawing whatever lessons they can. So this is all, I guess, more of a self therapy uh, mm-hmm. perspective because I know how busy executives are as well, and they might not always have time for therapy. But kind of, you know, these are the small things that they can do in their day to day. I would also um, suggest perhaps I don't know teaming up with someone else like a book club and kind of oh, you know. Um, just reflecting back what they've learned with somebody else, uh, uh-huh. you know, who can kind of um, offer new insights based on what they've read. Um, I often think that when we read a book, we only see one perspective and then there's somebody else who's read the same book and they offer like a lot of different insights. Yes. And it's nice, to, it's nice to be able to get all of that versus just uh-huh. your reading or something. Yes, yes. So, yeah. I've seen the the proliferation of of book clubs, and I am I'm slightly cynical. Not 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 of the the, the, sort of the public ones, you know the uh, you know reading fiction. But I've seen it yeah. in the media. A lot of people. I, I don't believe people are reading the books, um, and the, and there is some evidence. I mean, I remember reading. Um, it was a, an American study. Obviously, it's just one study, but it was a. They claim that only seventeen percent of business books sold were ever read, and yeah. of that seventeen percent, less than ten percent of the people who did it read more than the introduction. Yeah, it's incredible how many books I don't read them. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, I'm guilty. I mean, I, I am. I am literally surrounded by the things. You know, I I adore them. Yeah. I try to get yeah. through them. But yeah, how, how do you read them? <laughs> yeah. I've got a slight I mean, is that is it better to read them or is it better to listen to them or does it not matter? I think you have to do what you uh, what you immediately can connect with. So if you connect with the voice more and being read to, then I would yeah. say that. If you prefer reading and you're more visual, then I would say like paperback or Kindle. Um, I I'm a, I do all mediums, but like my biggest one is Kindle and Audio, just because I like yeah. to have my number on the go. Okay. Um, yeah. And do you think that the, um, the the summary services, like it used to be, uh, I'm showing my age here, but back when my grandfather was alive, there was a Reader's Digest. They used to send these, you know, four books in one. I've still got some of them around the house. Yeah, um, I love Reader's Digest. <laughs> I, I, I use one, one, called, uh, one called Blinkist I use. Yeah. Uh, business yeah. books, because most business books are... Uh, not great, you know. So I, but I like this, you know. I filter them by looking at the sort of the, the key outcomes, and then I go in and I read the book of the one that I think the outcomes are interesting. Uh, yeah, there's not always a correlation, but uh, what do you what do you think of that? What do you think of the sort of book summary? I, company? You know, I like I like Blinkist, and I agree. I think it is great for nonfiction. Yeah. Um, but I have read like some of the summaries, and sometimes I feel like some of it's just things are missed, right? Because you have to inevitably you know there's yeah. only so much you can include yeah. um yeah. so i don't always like i don't, like if i mean i guess if i like a book and i like the summary i'll be like okay i'm gonna go get the book now because i, I want to know more yeah. um so it's great from that perspective obviously it's great if you're short of time yes um and many people do like that so there's probably probably a market for that but mm-hmm. like you who likes to really get into a book or into yeah. something I think there will always be people who will need more than just the summary. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so if I right, I'm I'm really going to be nosy now. Hold on, I'll get us back on. <laughs> um, what's your what's your favorite book? What's my favorite book? Oh god! You, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Like my favorite book. I mean, I've read so many books, but so it's very hard to pinpoint a book that's the favorite. But the Celestine Prophecy, which is one that I love. So I can do it like 
different ages in my life. Um, so like Celestine Prophecy was when I was growing up. It's like mm-hmm. a it's like a fiction book. Yeah. But it's also just um it's it's like this just sorry, just give me a second, I'm just gonna my children. Um it's based in the like it's about the Aztecs and they have like this manuscript that talks about basically just all these ten secrets. Yes. Um, that gives you like the meaning of life and the philosophy, life philosophy. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully, oh, that's a shame. Hopefully, Bajal will get that back. I'll just put her off for a minute or two. You know, some weeks the technology is hilarious, isn't it? Um, so, well, Bajal's hopefully going to come back to us. Um, I, I think, oh, I can hear a beep. Hopefully, you're back. I don't see your picture yet, Bajal. I'll just. Keep talking. I'm going to show a video to see if we can give you some time to to sort that tech out. I have a I have quite an intimate relationship with books, and I'm not in any way uh, saying that um, I have the the depth of knowledge that uh, Bijal has, but uh, I, I I do see them as very special, and I think it was because of my grandfather, and I think he. He had no money, so he did tend to subscribe to Reader's Digest and things like that. So I do have a lot of these books around the house. But uh, about a year ago, two years ago, um, I uh, I wrote a piece of poetry about my relationship with books. And um, one of the things you learn when you're doing live broadcasting is always have a plan B. <laughs> so I'm going to show you this. It's a very short piece of poetry, but it, nevertheless, I, I wrote it. Um, and it, it kind of summarizes a lot of the wonder that I get from books. I, 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 I even, even the simplest book, even the Mills and Boone, Boone rubbish, um, I see it as rubbish, but other people get things from it. And I think Jao was, was, was really emphasizing that there's something there that, that you can take from a book. So this is, this is how I tried to summarize my relationship with books. With books. Marinating in a room of books, the hard backs with their strong, glossy armour, the soft backs opening for you to read their pages with a wild heart. No zen illusion, rather an invitation to a conversation. Hearing thoughts and feeling emotions, each a friend's tale and a lesson, some short and clear, others long and tedious. Dust jacket saying everything, or the twisting final paragraph, daunting effort and exhilarating potential, which story would you rather live? Go deeper and themes appear, from Beowulf to shades, the predicaments of human beings, revealing our inner desire for story. A vicarious experience, a mirror, wiring reality, but which reality? Regardless of truth, something dark tells us how the story ends. Inner lies creating gentle meaning, sculpting our conspiracies. Will the writer's vision be the end of us? So I wrote that in this room, and um, before it was this the studio that's normally here behind me, it was all books, and um, I get something quite, um, I mean, I'm not, as you know, I'm not into spirituality, and I'm not into a lot of the sort of the, the more esoteric things that people are into but there is something that i find very calming about books their general uh, the relationship with them and just the presence and i think it's why i'm so drawn to libraries and I, and i still escape you know once i get over this covid um i still go to oxford as often as i can uh to to read in the bodleian or to visit the new is it the western library beautiful place uh, very, very beautiful. Now, Bajal's back. Let's see if we can get this to work. Let's have a go. Come on, let's have a go. <laughs> Hi there. I'm terribly sorry, everyone. Uh, all right. yeah. it's not, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, one, of, one of the things you really learn about, uh, you know, this sort of world we live in, you know, all the organisations talk about how it's great to do visual and uh, virtual and, and all the rest of it. The technology's still catching up. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And it's yeah. just... Um, yeah. <laughs> so I was in the middle of asking you uh, what your favourite book was, and you like the Celestine Prophecy. 
Yes, the Celestine Prophecy. It's yeah. just an incredible book about our yeah. connection with nature. And I think like right now with climate change and everything, you know, it's it's a fascinating book. I mean, it talks about how plants uh, and nature really understand humans and that the relationship yeah. between them. Um, and the fact that we're so, it's such a sym symbiotic relationship. And I know it's quite, in a way, it's similar to um, The Overstory. I don't know if you've come across that. Um, yeah. It was like, and he's written a new book called, um, I think Richard Powers or something. Yeah, and he's written a new book called Bewilderment, which I'm about to read. And I know it, it won the man, did it win? It won, did it win the man book or something? Yeah, it's just amazing. Like, it's, it was shortlisted, sorry. Oh, okay. um, and it's, you know, the Celeste and Prophecy was obviously written a very long time ago. It's based on the Aztecs and their life philosophies. Um, but it's such an interesting way of looking at life and like how um, almost reminds me a little bit of Eastern philosophy in the sense that it's 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 more communal and it's less sort of individual. You know, we in the West we live in a very sort of individualized society. Yes. We're thinking about ourselves and the ego and. It's just a beautiful book on like group healing, um, right. the, the being a uh, part of a group with nature, like he, humans and trees. Um, yeah. And, you know, it was one of my favorite books growing up. And I think, you know, whilst it was based on this Aztec myth, it's it's a brilliant work of fiction, um, yeah. but with some truth in it. So I think, you know, you should really, I would really recommend that. Um, and then as I've grown up, you know, I, I, as a teenager, I love like A Thousand Splendid Sons, Khaled Hosni, yeah. um, who's actually sort of ex he's Afga Afghanistani and Americans, obviously, with everything going on in Afghanistan at the moment. It's, it's quite yeah. sad. But there's a lot of echoes of the Taliban rule in, in that book. Right. Um, but it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant book, just his writing and his ability to get into the, you know, people's. I haven't heard of that one. What was that? Remind, remind me of the name. I haven't heard of that one. What was the name again? A Thousand Splendid Sons. He also wrote The Kite Runner. Oh, so I know that. Of course yeah. 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 So this is the other one of his other books. Ah, Just right. okay. Brilliant, brilliant read. Right, okay. Um and then as time has gone on, I've I've become more interested in like therapeutic books, obviously, but like there's um some great auto fiction um that came out. Just a while ago, Laurie Gottlieb's Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. Mm -hmm. um, it's about a therapist talking about her own therapy, but also the therapy of her of her clients. Um, and she's written it in like a novel format, so it's super interesting. Right. Um, and, you know, I recently also read a nonfiction cookbook called Black Wave, which was brilliant. Oh, there you go. You've got it up. <laughs> Black Wave. Black Wave by Kim Gatta. Um, and it's actually a political book, but it's it's super interesting about like why the Middle East is in the situation that it that it, that it's currently in. Oh, right. um, okay. Obviously, sort of you know it all sort of well read. You need to also read a piece to end all piece before you read um, Black Wave <laughs> to give you the full history. But you know pre colonization, post colonization, the Iranian Revolution the Saudi, you know, um, anyway, I think I'm getting too technical, but um, it's just a brilliant, the way she's written it, this journalist, Kim Gattas, uh -huh. I think she's a journalist with the suit for CNN, right, brilliant storytelling, again, yeah. very fast paced, like, it's a very nice, but with everything that's going on at the moment, the good war, the bad war, like, I think there's, you know, the US label it, but the bad war with Iraq, the good war with um, Afghanistan, it, it's a brilliant book, um, non-fiction if you're into non-fiction and then other fiction books are like G Gentlemen of Moscow, I love that it was a great lockdown book <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I can keep so many recommendations to you guys so I think I should stop <laughs> no, 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 I, I think it, I think it's uh, I think it's a privilege personally, when someone recommends a book to me and they're being honest and I'll tell you why I say that in a minute because there is a reason why I say they're being honest I actually think it's a privilege because if they have invested let me just, I think we'll have to do this a different way, I'm going to have to put you off you're still here yeah, there's too much echo coming through um, I think what I mean here uh, Bijal is that I, 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 if someone says look I love this book, I have a, a real tendency of going and buying it because 
if if I know that person, or more important, I want to know that person, I think reading their favorite book can be quite quite a useful tool. And I and I used to use it, and I was slightly Machiavellian. I don't know what you think. You probably don't like this, but I am. Um, I used to do a uh, corporate internal coaching uh, uh, events for for companies. I don't do it anymore, but I used to do it. And I used to ask them all what was their favorite book before the event. And I'd, I'd pretty much read most of the books that they would say, you know, Lord of the Rings, Shogun, the usual, you know. But there was always a few of them I absolutely knew had never read that book. <laughs> and it, it used to make me giggle. I mean, I didn't, I didn't read them or anything, but it, they would, I mean, I would rather someone said, oh, I, I, my favorite book is The Beano. Yeah, read <laughs> War and Peace. You know, um, I don't know if you've come across that. It's like book lying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I th yeah, probably. I mean, I think people probably feel such a pressure to have to come across as cultured, or you know, or or, or, or people read well, um, and so yeah, and it's it's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very it's tough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, too, but it's a great way to know about someone. I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to really learn about somebody, like just through the books that they read. Like you instantly kind of get a sense of what kind of a person someone is, you know, their yeah. personality. So I that's a that's great trick. Right. <laughs> and no doubt some pseudo psychologist will have some way of putting people in boxes depending on the books <laughs> that they read. Uh, I'm sure there's a poor, I'm sure there's a model, you know, red yeah. book readers are this and yellow book readers are that. There, there always yeah. is somebody doing that. Um, yeah. And the, the, the final thing that I, I would really like, I mean, regular uh, followers of this show know, uh, Bishal, that I'm a, I'm a massive poetry fan and I, I'm not massively well read in terms of poetry. I mean, I have my probably 20 different poets that I really uh, love um, and I was never schooled in poetry particularly I mean I was weirdly um, when, I, when I was at university my very first university building was in Craig Lockhart in London in, in Edinburgh which is where Sassoon and Wilfred Owen wrote their great poems in, oh really in, okay in that building yeah it was the uh, <laughs> it was the hospital where the Coramess was written and others were written in that actual building. Oh, wow. Then, <laughs> but what do you think about, what, what is it about poetry? What does poetry bring that is maybe different to narrative storytelling or, or non-fiction? I think poetry, um, because it's so succinct and sharp, I think it instantly takes you into an emotional space. Uh, faster than I guess yeah. any sort of fictional narrative does, right, um, okay. and it's also and it's also um, it invites a lot of questions. I think that's what poetry does. I don't think it ever really answers a question, but I think it asks you a lot of questions because it really prompts a lot of thinking, and that's the reason why it's such a great therapeutic tool um, because it does really get you exploring, exploring your feelings. Um, and it can be quite triggering as well, more so than fiction, I think, because because it's giving you that sort of open access to maybe the writer or the poet's feeling. Yes. Um, yes. And then obviously through that, you're seeing yourself um, because it's triggering you. Right. Um, so I feel like it's probably more intimate in some ways than, you know, writing or narrative mm -hmm. fiction. Yeah. And... Why is it so many of us, I mean, we probably write more than any other time in human history, I would suggest right now, because um, the, the outcome, the, the, the amount of writing that kids do is unbelievable, you know, the social media, and uh, I guess it's not linked to quality always, but nevertheless, they're writing all the time. Why is it that we continue, despite all the tech, it's still the little stories that really matter? Yeah, it, I think it's because um, as humans, we're always searching for meaning yes. and we're searching for ourselves and we're searching for a sense of self as well. And I think stories offer all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's one of the things that, that stories do. They give us like the space to really kind of explore ourselves and to connect with others. 
which sometimes you know in reality can be quite difficult um people aren't always honest with each other (laughs) writing is always (laughs) honest in some ways you know um fiction is always like yeah it's even if it's fiction it's still uh a writer's kind of honest story or something um so i think this is this is what stories do it it, it, they they are i almost feel like make us feel connected to the world you know (laughs) Um, (laughs) that's a pretty good point to uh say thank you to you because i I think that's right Uh, and it's been (coughs) sorry (coughs) it's been it's been lovely speaking to you i'm sorry we've had some tech issues i'm so sorry as well it happens it happens um can I just say thank you very much for coming on? Uh, it's been lovely having you on. And I, and I think maybe given the tech issues, we might have to have you back again sometime uh, because I, th- there's a, there's an awful lot of questions in my head I didn't get to. So, you know, I'd like to ask you a lot more questions. And I'm I'm fascinated by your uh, the idea that you have. I'm fascinated by the, the reading list that you've got on your website. Uh, I love the idea of, of, of uh, it being linked to therapy. Uh, I'm not so keen on Freud, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I, you know, I, I, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Real pleasure. So. No, it's been such a pleasure, Scott. Thank you. I did bring an artifact. <laughs> oh, um, my let's, have you. let's have because it. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, I brought I brought my AirPods um, because oh. they're the things that connect me to everyone, like. <laughs> people's voices and I, when i when i hear people's voices i feel safe oh, yes. <laughs> and i and i also because i le- read a lot of audiobooks so yes, uh, it's my favorite thing to do <laughs> <laughs> thanks for remembering that sorry i, I forgot because all the tech it's my fault so thank you very no, much. No, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, it's been a real pleasure and i really do hope we can uh, have you on the show again that was that was great Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Speak to you later. (laughs) Speak to you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was lovely. I'm sorry there was a few tech issues, but nevertheless, there was a there was a nice theme there of uh, the importance of of why we should be thinking about stories in a broader sense, and actually, they can do stuff that's really good for us in here. So, uh, I've I've never come across someone that does that for a living before, as you could probably tell. Uh, And I do have millions of questions, um, so I think we'll have to see if I can persuade her to come back on again, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. So that was show 49. This is Artifact Live, and we look at the art and science of storytelling, and uh, next week is my big 5-0, and I was wondering what to do about that and how to bring 50... I can't believe I've done 50 shows. Uh, 50 shows, you know, uh, coming together, uh, how am I going to celebrate it? I thought, well, initially I was going to do some editing and I was going to do one of those, like, do you remember, like, all the old American TV shows used to have, like, Dallas, where there'd be an episode where it'd be a flashback episode? Well, no, I'm not going to do that, because one editing um, something like, oh, God, how many hours is it now? 120 hours of uh, of Artifact. I'm not sure if I've managed to all of that at once, so I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to do, I, I've got uh, one of my buddies come back on again because um, him and I, um, and it's this guy here, Tom Stanhope, him and I um, started sort of looking at changing our careers, if you like, or changing the focus of our careers when lockdown happened. Uh, Tom, who's been on the show a couple of times, uh, used to make films. He still makes films and he's good at it. Um, but he realised that his business was was not going to survive lockdown. So what he did was he just turned the camera around and started to talk about broadcasting. I think he's done a terrific job. And I, and I, but I want to talk to him about that. And there's a story in that in itself because it's a proper transformation story in my opinion. So it's well worth. Let's just have a you know reconnect with Tom. But also I want I wanted somebody that I'm comfortable with in terms of just having a chat about how I feel the the first fifty have gone. You know. Have we used the, the time well? Have we have we created the body of work that I was hoping to create? Have we helped the audience? Have we helped you uh, with your journey as a storyteller? And if we have, great. How have we done that? And if we haven't, how could we change it? How could we make it better? How could we, you know, build on this incredible? It's incredible the number of people I've had on the show now. Wonderful people. So. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so I hope you can join me next week. So it'll just be called Storytelling next week, show 50. Uh, and it's uh, something that 
if you'd asked me 12 months ago that I would end up having done 50 shows, I would have said you were an idiot. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's something I'm, I'm really quite proud of. It is moving to 12.30, as I said, at the start of the show. The reason for that is a few people have said, well, we're back in the office now. Would you mind moving it to lunchtime so we can still tune in? So I'm responding to the audience, and I'm going to move that the show to 12.30. I hope that's okay for everybody. I'm still going to do the replay at 12 o'clock on, on a Saturday afternoon because I think that still fits with some people's diaries. So I'm going to continue to do that. And that leaves me really with uh, just to say thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much for my guest, Beja Shah. I thought she was absolutely magic and did really well with the technology she was having to put up with. So thank you very, very much, Bijal. It was terrific to have you on the show. My name is Scott MacArthur, and you've been watching Artifact Live, and I can't wait to come back with the 50th show next week.